Thank you. Medicine and disease cure each other. The whole world is medicine. What is the self? I'm going to start by trying to understand this riddle, this koan, um, in, not in a discursive way, but actually trying to let it un understand it through our own experience. How does it resonate with us? What is the truth or the meaning of this for our own experience? In my role as a palliative care doctor, I've found that while we can see how medicine has the potential for curing disease, how is it that disease cures medicine? So I think about myself and taking care of patients, trying to subdue disease, which is actually another translation of this, medicine and disease subdue each other. So when I'm subduing the ravages of disease, pain, symptoms, both in the patients and the impact that it has on family members, there comes with it a great satisfaction, a great fulfillment, even a healing within me, perhaps filling some void within myself. And in this way, I can see how this resonates, that there is some healing that's happening. There is some, some connection that's happening. Without disease, there would be no medicine. The whole world is medicine. Well, how is that? How is it that the whole world is medicine? There's an interesting story that comes from the Buddhist tradition of Manjushri, who's a bodhisattva, and he's speaking to one of his students. And he says, uh, and they're out picking herbs, medicinal herbs, and he says to him, bring me something that is not medicine. And the student comes back and says, Master, I, I cannot find anything that is not medicine. And he says, bring me something that is medicine. And he hands him a blade of grass. And he says, with this blade of grass, can both take life and give life. And so again, we might be puzzled by that. What is the meaning of that? How is that? Um, I think maybe of a more contemporary example, um, thinking about a cigarette. Uh, think of a long time chronic cigarette smoker who has experienced the ravages of disease. And for most of his life, the cigarette and smoking has been a poison to him, has been a source of causing injury to his body. And yet, at the end of his life, as his life starts to fade away, we may imagine that same cigarette that was a poison is now a source of healing, maybe a, a, a moment of peace, a tranquility, uh, a sense of, who knows, some sublime. We heard talked about that earlier. So there's something that we can imagine. When something's used as a poison, it's a poison. Something's used as a medicine, it can be a medicine. And the whole world is filled with that potential, potential for healing. And that's what this is, talk is going to be about, actually. And what is the self? Right? The great enigmatic question, what is the self? I mean, the study of the self is really what Buddhism is all about in trying to unpack, well, what is the self? Is it some kind of construct based on thoughts, beliefs, this body, the continuity in time? When we start breaking down what the self is, we find that it's actually empty. There is no self. And, and this, in this way, I'd like to propose that we do a similar thing and a similar exercise when we're in the patient encounter to break down the boundaries between self and other. And that is what I think we can learn from the Buddha, is that one way in which we can try to experience what it is for a patient is imagine us in a similar, in a similar place. There is no separation. If there is no self, then the whole world potentially is, is all the same. There is no separation. There's nothing to be attached to. And so in seeing the other as our self, we're able to break down, allow the, the boundaries to become more uh, uh, fluid, as it were. So we know that medicine, modern medicine, both alleviates suffering and can cause suffering. Um, we know how it alleviates it. I mean, I see it all the time in the hospital. We can treat pain when we do it well. It can alleviate patient suffering. We can treat other symptoms. We can cure people. Um, but how does, it, how does it cause suffering? Well, I think we have to think of what is suffering to begin with. Uh, one definition that I, I tend to use or I tend to like um, is from Eric Cassell, who's a professor at uh, Cornell. And he talks about suffering as being any insult to the intactness of personhood. And it's only persons that suffer, okay? So any, in, any, in any domain of what it is to be a person, whether it be physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, social, all of these things are ways in which we can have the potential for suffering, any, anything that insults that. 
and so we can see how we can do this in all sorts of, of subtle ways. I mean, we obviously know the, the great ways in which we can cause suffering, iatrogenic ways, where medicine is imp improperly administered or uh, mistakes are made. Um, but we can also do it in subtle ways, creating more anxiety by the way we give information, by not giving information properly, by creating fear, creating shame. These are ways in which we can actually cause more suffering. And so it's our task to try to think how can we alleviate that? How can we decrease the amount of suffering that we're causing in the healing uh, environment in healthcare? So what is it that experienced patients want? Well, we actually know patients who are living with chronic illness, they actually are very clear about what they want. They want good pain and symptom control. They want to not prolong the dying process when they get to that point. They want to have a sense of control, to control their own fate, not to be ravaged by things, but to actually know what's going on, have a sense of control, get the information that they need, and relieve burdens on their family. These are all important things to them, and strengthen relationships with loved ones. Notice on here there's nothing about wanting to live longer, per se, or wanting to be cured, per se, but that these are the things that are most important to experienced patients. It's actually what we're doing in palliative care, which is the practice, the field of medicine that I work in. We deal with symptom, symptom management, pain, symptom control. We listen, and this largely is going to be about listening, Look, communicating effectively, trying to understand what's really going on, what's most important here, focusing on the goals of care. In order to do that, it really is important to ask the question, what's most important to you? Well, another way in which we're, we can cause suffering is by when our treatments don't match the patient's goals of care. It's not always obvious that everybody wants the same thing. You have to explore that. What are their values? What are their goals? And supportive counseling for patients and families to maybe allow them to, not, to reduce the burdens on their family, to allow them to have a sense of control, to allow them to feel, uh, to strengthen relationships and so forth. I want you to listen, well, not with your ears, but with your whole body for the next minute. actually listening to were this giant 70-ton bell from a Kyoto monastery recorded with acoustic recordings uh, with uh, microphones that would pick up the subtle vibrations that are happening when this bell is not ringing, when it's silent, not moving whatsoever, at least not apparently so, to the, to the ear. This is from an experiential artist named Bill Fontana who did an exhibit uh, at the Rubin Museum a few years back called Silent Echoes. So what we're actually listening is to this bell resonating all the sounds of the universe as it is experiencing it in real time, right in that immediate environment. Everything that's happening is causing something to go on there. This is the piece that's missing in modern medicine. This is the listening that needs to happen. What's happening in between the words after someone breaks bad news? after we share a difficult diagnosis, after we are encountering a patient in distress. What is, what, how can we be present and listen, be in that moment of silence, and observe everything that's going on? Just like this bell is observing everything that's going on in the immediate environment, we have to be like that as well. It's not, it's not just through words. It's not just through what's being said. It's also through what's not being said. The nonverbal, the experiences, the facial expressions, the anger, the fear, all of these things matter. All of these things are part of the patient experience. And we actually know that listening alleviates suffering. If we're in the business of, of alleviating suffering, we have to listen. There was an, a really interesting experiment done by uh, Latrette and colleagues in France where they proposed an intervention into the ICUs there, in about 20 ICUs, um, looking at patients who were, uh, were they expected to die and they wanted to see if they could reduce the bereavement experience of their loved ones. And so they taught a communication strategy to one arm, to the intervention group, and to the other arm not, and they also provide some bereavement uh, uh, information. 
And the arm that they had the intervention with, they used communication skills, they actually found that in those, in those family meetings, they were listening longer. They were speaking less, allowing patients and fa family members, rather, to speak more, and listening much less, and, and listening more. So in that, in, in, when, in doing so, they actually found less incidence of PTSD, ang uh, anxiety, and depression associated in the, in, the fam in the families that were receiving that kind of uh, attention. So listening actually does good. It does, it relieves suffering. It can relieve the burden uh, on families to allow them to share what they're going through. So we contemplate all the time in medicine. You know, we're always taught how to do a differential diagnosis. What are the labs? What are the radiological findings? What do we need to do? What's the workup? And so on and so forth. But how can we be more contemplative? How can we take what we learn from those who devote their life to prayer, to meditation, monks and nuns in monasteries and convents who are living a contemplative life. So this is something called contemplative care, which actually my, my friends and colleagues at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care have shown us what this, what this approach to caregiving is all about. It incorporates mindfulness practice, compassionate action, and moment-to-moment -moment awareness while in relationship with the one being cared for. This is about listening. It's about being present. It's about being there and not letting simply yourself looking at the other, but allowing, the, allowing that to dissolve a bit, allowing the self and other to, to melt away, to experience what is going on here. Okay. So what, what can the Buddha teach medicine? What can we learn? Well, I like to think of the, the, the three jewels, which are the three treasures, or the guides for a, a Buddhist uh, life. Um, and I'm just going to go through them very quickly, um, but just to give you a sense of how we can actually take these foundations, these refuges, as it were, and put them into our medical practice. And we actually did a symposium on just that, where we, we gathered contemplative care practitioners, Buddhists, non-Buddhists, palliative care practitioners, and brought them together in a, in a symposium, and we explored exactly these things, the three jewels. The first, the Buddha. This is the awareness, being self-aware. This is what we might think of as awakening, the awakened one. That's what the Buddha means. So how can we be more awake in the moment? How can we take care of ourselves? How can we experience what's going on in the, in the clinical encounter? to not just simply be giving and giving and giving, but to actually be present, to, to allow for ourselves to also be part of that healing as well, right? Medicine and disease heal each other, cure each other. This is the Dharma. This is the whole world is medicine. Everything out there in the world can teach us. There's lessons to be learned from every moment, from every encounter. This is where the listening allows us to pay attention to what can we learn in this moment, right now? What's happening right here? How can we learn right, something about this patient, about ourselves, about, about healing? What can we learn right now? Okay. And finally, Sangha, which is community. That is to say, we're not in this alone. We take care of others, and we take care of ourselves together in a community. We can't do this alone. We do this alone, you have burnout. right? You can't be effective. You need a community. You need to be able to share what you're experiencing, to grow together to see the commonness in all of this, the common experience. And I think if we took these three pillars in Buddhism, these three jewels, and applied them to our practice in medicine, I think we could see a real shift happening, that the high cost of care, the unnecessary suffering, if we can start paying attention to what really matters most here, what's most important to patients and families, how can we fine tune our encounter to allow for that to come to the surface, I think we will see a, a different healing environment. So I ask us to all be here now, present in our own community, impacting on the world in the best way that you can. Thank you so much.